Um, my name's Dr Helen Fees. I work at the Australian Population and Migration and Research Centre and I'll be the MC for the afternoon. Um, and right now I would like to welcome Professor Costas Mavramaras, who I've probably... Is that okay? Wow. <laughs> From Flinders University, who is going to be your chair for the next session on Migration Skills Employment in the Australian Labour Force. If you could welcome... Really, it's 10 out of 10. I'm used to my name being bang mangled badly, but uh, <laughs> uh, good morning. Um, so uh, it's, it's, I, I th this is going to be a really interesting session. Uh, it's about migrant skills and employment. I mean, I, I liked very much what uh, Graham said earlier on about the war for talent in a very fast changing world. world. So this, this is what it's all about, I think. We're shifting from a very, very different type of migration to something which is very new. It's far more mobile. Uh, it's in and out. And we see it happen as we live. We, we don't observe it as much because it's happening as we live. But I think if you, if, you, if you put it in the context of how migration has changed in the last two or three centuries, you see that it's a really fast changing world. I think there's, uh, there's, there's lots of issues that uh, relate to skills, the migrant skills, and uh, and, and, and the, their employment position in the country they go to. Uh, what this, and, the, and they both go, when you look at it, for, at least from an economics point of view, they go uh, both to the equity side as, the, as, as well as the efficiency side. When you look at them from the legal point of view, again, you've got massive equity issues. So it's, it's a really important area. Australia is really doing extremely well, very targeted. Uh, uh, approach to migration, but the main concern, of course, is uh, does it work for us? And that's, uh, I think, what what you'll hear today in 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 different guises. It's a, it's quite a well balanced session. First, we'll have uh, Peter Peter McDonald, who's I'm sorry, I have to read the bias because I've got a terrible memory, so I can't remember more than five sentences in, in, a, in a whole. So, uh, Peter. I, I remember that he's from the Crawford School, and he's at the ANU, and he's a demography professor, but you know him. Uh, Henry, <laughs> Henry, Henry, uh, with all due respect, uh, you're famous, in other words, especially with the report that came out today. That's, that's really very fortuitous. Henry Sherrill is, is, is representative of Australian Migration Council. He's a policy analyst with, with a background in, in what used to be DIAC. And he is going to talk, he's going to give us some evidence which comes from a survey that, uh, that has been generated by DIAC. So there's some hard evidence there. Then Alex Riley, who's an associate professor at Adelaide Uni and specializes in law, is going to give us a, a very nuanced view about the way regulation works for different types of migration. So he's going to talk about the 457s and how they, they can be juxtaposed with, with uh, the uh, less uh, research, less looked at, uh, uh, lower skill temporary mi migrants. And uh, we'll finish the session with Liz Temple, whose, whose background is, is in the union movement for, for quite a long time. She's the regional secretary of the CPSU and also the vice president of SA Unions. And she's also going to focus on uh, on regulation and how this works in this in the context of this very fast changing world. So I'd like you to welcome Peter and I'll go and sit down and enjoy myself too. Okay, sorry to be back so soon. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking about the, the big picture here. Uh, I'm not talking about 457s uh, because 457s are the little picture. 457s are 1% of the Australian labour force, yet they create this enormous discussion, but they are just 1% of the Australian labour force. So I'm talking about the total Australian labour force and the role of migrants in that. Uh, and uh, are migrants getting all the jobs and displacing Australian workers? A, a nice question. Uh, well, here's a, some, what I've done is to uh, compare 2009 with 2014, a five-year period, 
Uh, why did I take five years? Because I was using age groups, and all the published data is in five-year age groups. <laughs> Simple as that. Uh, so I went back five years, uh, and I looked at the change in the Australian labour force uh, between 2009, this is the numbers, uh, to 2014. And I've divided them here into three categories. This is the, the total increase in the Australian labour force over that period was close to 800,000. Uh, people. This, this is employment rather than labour force, sorry. These are people who are employed. Uh, about 800,000 extra. And migrants were 600,000 of them. Migrants in that five year period. People who came in just in that five year period uh, made up most of the increase in Australian employment in that period. Uh, and uh, more of it, and another huge group, uh, 330,000 are people over the age of 55. Two reasons. They have higher participation rates. They're much more likely to be working over this period. Uh, but also, there are more of them. <laughs> there's there's a quite, quite a lot more of them because of the, the, the baby boom generation, etc. So uh, 930,000 increase due to two groups. People, non-migrants aged 55 and over, and migrants of a total of 800,000. So that means, as we see on the top line there, that the rest of the Australian labour force, the standard non-migrants under the age of 55, actually fell. That the employment in those ages fell in Australia. So that if the, we had not had this big increase at the older ages, if we had not had migration, the Australian labour force would have fallen in, in number in this period. Uh, <coughs> this is the argument. Uh, and the, if you look at the industries where there was increase, uh, you can see that it kind of goes along a bit. It's pretty much all in the kind of services end of things, except for the mining one, uh, where the, and the mining one is, has the biggest percentage increase. But uh, so this is kind of consistent with older women. <laughs> uh, but it's also consistent uh, with some of the migrants uh, uh, coming in in these, these kinds of areas. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about uh, academic migrants uh, who are quite substantial in number. <laughs> uh, but 40% of the total in health, social and, and education, uh, totally employment increase. So quite concentrated. <clears throat> so as I said, 932,000 migrants and older people got the jobs in that period. But did they force more Australians into unemployment? Now, here's the change in unemployment. Uh, and I've, it's full-time, people seeking full-time work. Because a lot of unemployment is of students who, you know, full-time students who are looking for work somewhere. So you have to take them out. Uh, this is people looking for full-time work uh, and the change over that period. And you see the total unemployment increased by 11,000 people over this period, 11,000 people which is totally trivial compared to the 932,000 increase in employment. Uh, and, the, if you look, and if you look at the groups where the unemployment increased, the, the primary group is women aged 35 to 54, uh, increasing by 17,000, more than the total increase in, in unemployment. Why was that so? Because governments in this period moved on people on sole parent pensions, uh, and said, you will, once your child reaches a particular age, uh, you are no longer going to be provided with this pension and you are going to be on the unemployment benefit. So there is a shift for women of that age. Uh, it's not that they are being kept out of work, they're out of work anyway. Uh, they're just being reclassified to, to unemployed. Uh, and these numbers, as the note says, actually might include some of the migrants too. I wasn't able to take them out. So the summary is that unemployment is not about Australians losing out in competition with migrants or with older Australians. You could make that argument equally. Uh, unemployment is about the skill levels of the unemployed people in general, uh, and it's a long-term issue. Uh, so the same numbers of people were unemployed uh, five years ago as, as now. Uh, that was before these migrants came into the country. And uh, I think that blaming the migrants draws attention away from the real issue, 
which is a low-skilled issue and a training issue. Uh, not uh, for the, in the most part, uh, migrants are, are a higher skill level. <coughs> Looking at persons under the age of 25, where there's a lot of attention, uh, unemployed and not in full-time education, uh, uh, the, that's the number now uh, in 2014. 146,000, but there are some groups that you might think might compete with these people, uh, Australians who are unemployed and under the age of 25, but they are um, students, Australian students, uh, who are working part-time, very large number of them. Uh, there are international students who work part-time, usually, uh, and there are working holiday makers who are often working full-time. So you can see the numbers in those categories there, once you add them up, uh, they are very big compared to the current level of unemployed. But the, uh, the issue is that the nature of the Australian labour force for under 25 year olds has changed dramatically. So that once upon a time, back in 1984, 80% 80 of people working in Australia under the age of 25 were employ employed full time. Now it's only 50%. So there's been a huge shift towards part-time work. And these kinds of groups, the students, <coughs> Australian and international, and working holiday makers kind of fit into that model very well. They, they fit that model and employers really like them for that kind of reason. Uh, the unemployed Australians uh, are actually not quite in the same labour market. They're looking for full-time work. Uh, for men in this kind of age range, full-time work is very, particularly as you get younger age, under 20, uh, is very much blue-collar work. Uh, and uh, that's where, of course, there's, there are problems. Uh, so even for this group, what I'm arguing is don't blame the migrants. It's about what we do <laughs> in terms of training uh, and, and skill levels. But do migrants have an advantage over newly qualified Australian professionals? Another question. Uh, and I think this is a much more relevant question. Uh, this is the issue that migrants with five to ten years experience will be better skilled than a new Australian graduate who doesn't have any experience. Uh, and feels that where this might occur, in particular uh, in the academic field, uh, for nurses, IT, uh, and on the basis of the selection criteria usually, the migrant is better qualified, has the experience, but uh, the Australian might be stopped from getting that experience by being able to appoint more experienced people all the time. I think this is a, an issue. Uh, but what weight do, should we put to the notion of international labour markets? So Australian universities will say, it doesn't matter a fig, you know, whether it's a migrant or whether it's an Australian, uh, because we're an international labour market. We're going to hire whoever we like from anywhere in the world. And that, to what extent does that apply in other areas? Well, maybe in IT there's some logic to that too. Uh, as well, but in IT people will say that, that there's somebody working in London on a particular application. Uh, and. Uh, you, the same application, almost exactly the same application comes up in Australia in a business. So you bring that person from London and they work on the application in Australia and then they leave the country. And a lot of the IT people do leave, as, as uh, Graham was saying earlier, they're not all about permanent residents. They're people who are moving around the world. Uh, but I think there is some question, and uh, I raised this in an article in Australia recently, about kind of commitment to Australia and the long-term interests of those employers. Uh, that they might be meeting their short-term interest, but in the longer term to have kind of committed workers who are there out into the future instead of rolling people over all the time uh, might be a, a better uh, approach. So I think there is an issue there. Uh, so long-term interest might be better served by investing in the Australian, young Australian graduates, the employer's interest and Australia's interest, and of course primarily the, the young graduates' interest. That's what's happened with academics in, in recent times, and it's a bit surprising that in a one three-year period, 2008-9 to 2010-11, 1900, and then in the next three-year period, 5,200, 5,200 overseas academics recruited, a sudden shift. Uh, and they, 
The overseas academic will have more publications, etc. They're more experienced than the new Australian graduate. And I think there is a bit of an issue here and, and in, potentially in some other occupations. Uh, migrants provide a demographic bonus by increasing the portion of the population in the labour force ages. Uh, well, the answer is basically yes. Uh, the, uh, this is the percent of the population aged 15 to 64 in 2053, uh, based on uh, projections. Uh, and, uh, and Graham says, well, projections, yeah. <laughs> but uh, you can see that there is a, uh, an impact on the percentage of the population who are in the labour force ages, which moves along with migration. Uh, it might not be huge, yeah, but, uh, but, it's, but it's there. Uh, and this is the percentage of the population aged 65 and over. Zero migration, 28%. Uh, current level, oh, sorry, that's, this is 2014 current level. Uh, it's maybe, you know, it's, it's, it drops down to about 23% with migration as it is at the moment. Five percentage points, it's actually meaningful uh, given the uh, uh, proportion. So what does that mean for uh, the labour force? So this is the Australian labour force with zero migration in these projections, perfectly flat, uh, even falling. Uh, and uh, a lot of this growth, even with the zero, uh, is actually the former migrants who, before you start doing these projections. <laughs> uh, and then you've uh, got the, it, it, it has a big and immediate impact on the size of the Australian labour force, uh, changes in migration. Uh, but, what, oops, sorry. Uh, GDP per capita is the other uh, interesting issue. And this shows you the, uh, the impact of different levels of migration on GDP per capita. And in, in this present decade, there's a huge impact. Uh, and it's only the result of ageing. This is, this is only taking, everything else remains constant. The only thing that changes is the age structure of the population. Uh, and uh, in these projections, so that no matter what we do with migration, there's a big drop uh, due to the ageing, the retirement of the baby boom generation, the ageing of the population that's happening in this decade. Uh, but that drop is modified somewhat by the level of migration. Uh, in a, and these, you know, uh, this is per annum, so these kind of measures accumulate over, uh, over time quite substantially. Uh, so there is a, an argument that uh, uh, migration is beneficial in this current context, uh, for that reason. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick things. New permanent migrants are increasingly sourced from among temporary migrants. Uh, that's the temporary, Graham shows you that. But Graham actually showed you the same slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, these are the proportions that are on, sh uh, uh, sorry, the blue ones on shore uh, of the different migration categories. And you can see that, as he, he was saying, a, a very high proportion of current new Permanent migrants are already on shore, uh, and that includes those in the, uh, in the in the partner category. Interestingly, <laughs> so they're, they're, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, and this is the conversions from a four five seven to permanent residence. This is the kind of try before you buy approach that we have today, and uh, the em the employer nominated permanent residents, fifty eight percent of them were on a four five seven, so. That, that kind of pathway, you get a job on a four five. Well, you might come in on something else, you know, uh, some other visa, but you, you, you moved through to a four five seven, and then you get nominated by your employer, or also through these other uh, uh, regional categories uh, for permanent migration, and so you get that uh, uh, outcome there. That so that the, the, one of the points to make there, though, al although four five seven is very small it plays a kind of central role in the Australian permanent migration program uh, at present. Conclusion, the growth in employment in Australia is contingent on the recruitment of skilled immigrants and the 457 visa now plays that, the central role in that process. And therefore it's important to lift the shackles on the 457 visa while improving its integrity. Uh, and that's important to the health of the Australian economy. A final comment, the, you hear the Governor of the Reserve Bank, uh, Glenn Stevens, saying, why aren't Australian businesses investing? The capital is cheap, uh, there's confidence. The principal reason is skilled labour. 
uh, access to skilled labour. It's not a lot of skilled labour, it's those crucial people that you need to actually get this thing moving. Uh, if you, you get that crucial person, then there's more jobs for unemployed Australians, uh, is, is the outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Our second speaker, if we could uh, introduce Henry Shelton. He's going to speak for a few minutes. Yep. Oh, thanks. Um, I might just make one very, very quick comment, which probably concerns a lot of people in this room about that academic 457 slide. Um, I used to work in the department in the 457 policy section. Uh, don't be too worried, they're not all academics. The, the department takes a very broad uh, sense of what a university lecturer is or what a researcher is, and you'll find people working at universities in places you didn't even know exist are on 457 visas under the term academic or university lecturer. So don't be, don't be too worried about that type of stuff. 85% um, are in the G08. Yeah? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. But I think that I think that reflects the really big bureaucracies in those universities. Um, that's maybe another topic. But just to just to just to soothe soothe some worried minds out there. Um, my name's Henry Sherrill. I work at the Migration Council Australia. We're an independent non-profit organisation uh, doing advocacy work and research work on immigration and settlement. Um, last year we put out a survey publication called. Uh, 457 visas, more than temporary. Um, this survey uh, was, there's been some surveys in the past, um, Graham Hugo's uh, in 2003, 2004, I think Peter as well, um, have, have done this type of work. To my knowledge though, this was uh, the first departmental funded major sort of survey of thousands and thousands of people. It was 3,800 people and 1,600 employers. Um, which get, get, gives some pretty good uh, response rate in a program of about 100,000 visa holders and 35,000 employers. Um, the main findings from the survey were that 83% of employers said they used the program because it was difficult to recruit in the local labour market. That's something we should expect, um, but I think it's also good to reaffirm policy goals as well. 68% um, of employers said that 457 visa holders helped train their workforce. Um, I was a bit suspicious of this finding, um, especially because 80% of multinational firms said uh, the same thing. But when you look at the migrants, 75% of migrants also say they help train Australian workers. So it's good to get sort of both sides of, of that independent of one another. For migrants, um, 9 out of 10, about 88% were satisfied or very satisfied with the relationship they had with their employer, which I think is a very good indicator of the program on, at a macro level. Uh, obviously, there's 10% missing uh, from that. Um, and so it, I think our main takeaway that the program as a whole is working very well on that macro level, but there is definitely some areas of concern uh, at the margins. Um, we think that these results uh, should not be undersold. Um, this program, temporary skilled migration programs across OECD countries are, are very hard to get right. Uh, you ask an American about the H-1B program and you'll get, oh, it, it's a mess. Um, it's, it's, it doesn't work very well. It works for very, very specific industries and it's capped at 65,000. They've been trying to reform it for 15 years and they just can't do it. Um, so I think in Australia, we've had both political parties uh, have had major reforms to the 457 program. Uh, the Howard government introduced minimum salaries and English language requirements originally. The ALP introduced a market salary framework, which has become the, the core foundation of the program. Um, as I said, 11% uh, of migrants were dissatisfied with their wages, um, and perhaps relatedly, 11% relatedly, of migrants also had an income of $50,000 or less. Um, this was in 2012, uh, and this at the time was in the, within a, a couple of hundred dollars of the wage threshold of $49,300. So when you do, you do have an average salary of about eighty dollars to $90,000, it fluctuates a little bit, but you need to remember that there are very certain segments and cohorts of this program, and there's 10% right at the bottom, and then there's everyone else, there's that long tail effect that you sort of get, everyone else sort of 
uh, over the much bigger salaries. Um, of those 11% who earned $50,000 or less, 70% were from non-English speaking background compared to one in two for the program as a whole. So you see it skewing a little bit towards a non-English background at those lower salary levels, which are also associated with more lower skilled occupations, such as cooks, retail managers, and program and project administrators. Um, that's probably all I'll say at the moment. Um, I've, I've got a longer version of the research if you're interested in it on at lunchtime. Uh, and yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. It's a quick one. We've got to leave some time for questions. So if, I, if you could welcome Alex Riley uh, from Adelaide. Thank you. Good afternoon, all, and thank you, Peter, for your presentation. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the role of working holiday makers and international students in the Australian labour market, because in fact they play a fairly large role. And uh, it was hinted at by Graham in his, his presentation before, the enormous rise in the number of working holiday makers in recent times, and also the, the number of international students in Australia is also very high. And in fact, the numbers in those two programs really dwarf the numbers in, uh, of 457s. And it, to me, it really highlights the review of the 457s that came down yesterday, highlights the lack of a review for working holiday makers and international students in terms of their work. Um, now, just to put it in context, when we talk about the regulation of, of um, migrant labourers in Australia, there are various types of regulation. There's our labour laws, so the Fair Work Act, which applies to everyone. So anyone who uh, works in Australia is subject to a minimum wage and, and minimum conditions of work, and that applies to any worker. But with 457s, we have another layer of regulation, which you might call migration regulation, and in a way that's what Peter and the review were looking at. And that ensures for 457s that you have payment of a market wage, that you have a uh, employer sponsor who um, can only employ you once they've satisfied certain conditions that they've demonstrated they have a need for, for a worker. So that there's extra regulations that um, ensure the integrity of the 457 program. Well, in terms of international students and working holiday makers, there is none of that regulation. So international students and working holiday makers are only restricted in, uh, they're not restricted in where they can work or in what industry they can work. International students are restricted in how long they can work. They can work 40 hours per fortnight. And working holiday makers are restricted also in how much work they can do in their one year visa. It's a maximum of six months with any one employer. So, what concerns me is there is this enormous body of workers who are highly vulnerable given their migration status. And there's also the question of how they work in the labour market. Are they taking the jobs of, of young Australians? It's very hard to tell. Um, there's, there's some research, um, certainly the, in, a, in a time when employment is going down and, and unemployment is going up, um, then that is more of a concern. And uh, as Graham, in fact, mentioned, one thing with uh, international students and working holiday makers, sometimes they go in the opposite direction to the economic cycle. With 457s, we expect that the numbers will reduce when economic, when, uh, economic times aren't so good. They're responsive to, to the, the labour market. International students and working holiday makers, it might work the other way. So when economic times are bad, people go into education and so that our numbers might rise. And in fact, if you look at the figures, 457s have gone down in the last year and there might be particular regulatory reasons for that, but it might also be um, partly that there's a response to economic times, whereas numbers in international, of international students and working holiday makers are going up. So what do we do about this? I just, just a couple of points on reform. It seems to me that we do need more regulation of working holiday makers and international students. Um, there are some fairly obvious um, directions of reform it seems to me. One is in relation to working holiday makers. There was the introduction of a second working holiday maker visa uh, recently. And if you look at the numbers in that program, you've got to have demonstrated you, you worked in a regional area for a certain period of time to be eligible for this visa. 
that immediately makes the working holiday visa focusing on being a, a um, work program. Because if you work for this period of time, you get a second visa, which is really aimed at working in regional areas. And in fact, there are five specified areas of employment, which include construction, include mining, and include areas of, uh, which are very much focused on employment. I would say that there's probably a good case for getting rid of the second working holiday visa. I think that does skew the, the program quite uh, in the wrong direction. In relation to international students, there might, we, are, we give the most generous work rights to international students of, of all countries who have a, um, large numbers of international students. For many countries, they're restricted to working either on campus or they apply for the right to work outside campus. We give international students a right straight away to work. Um, one way you might restrict it without restricting it too much is to say there should be a relationship between work and study. Or you might, not, you might recognise that there are some types of employment that um, students should be excluded from. For example, you might say, you might make exclusions on the basis of the physical nature of the work, the risk of personal injury associated with the work, the suitability of work for part-time employment. Students can only work part-time, but there's no restriction on what work they can do, and some jobs are really tailored towards full-time employment. You might also have restrictions in relation to its proximity, the proximity of the work to the higher education institution where they're studying, um, or even a relationship between the student's course of study uh, and the work that they are doing. These are just some ideas. But I think what it does point to finally is that we have this strange dichotomy in our, in our temporary migration program at the moment. We have the 457s which is focused on skilled workers and then we have a whole lot of unskilled work being done by temporary labour migrants that is not regulated effectively. And it might be that we need to rethink this and either get rid of the idea of skilled versus unskilled and look at what are um, areas of employment in demand in Australia and needed, looking at it in a, in a holistic way, or introduce a dedicated unskilled migrant worker visa that has some of the protections that we see in the 457 visa program. So I'll leave it there. Our last brief speaker is uh, Liz Temple from uh, SA Unions, or Unions SA, whichever way it is. Please. And Hi. Um, I suppose from a labour movement point of view, um, while we absolutely support um, this program, the concerns we have are twofold um, and at this point in time where the discussion is occurring, the priority for us is to see the regulations that have been put in place and the integrity of the system as it stands maintained. Um, so as a union movement, what we absolutely would not want to see is um, a situation where a 457 visa program could be used to undercut wages and conditions of Australian workers. And fundamentally, that's our priority. Um, we also think at the current time, the labour market test that's in place is incredibly important. Um, and from our perspective, if an employer has a need to fill a skills gap, um, then they should have no problem with demonstrating that by advertising the jobs in Australia in the first instance. Um, currently, I think where unemployment is hitting a 10-year high in this country and is particularly, I think, impacting on younger people, um, where we have a government that is, is basically saying if people under 30 don't get a job as soon as they leave school or university, they are going to have no income support for six months. It's really important these protections are in place. Um, and history will tell us that, unfortunately, this scheme was being abused before the protections were put in place. Um, so we'd absolutely be arguing they need to be maintained. Um, we would be in furious agreement with Peter about the need to provide training and skills, particularly to younger Australians. So where a skills gap is identified and it's necessary to bring in workers, then we would argue that that employer um, has a bit of a responsibility to the community 
to then be spending some of the profits they make on training um, Australian workers, particularly younger workers. The other aspect that we have to deal with is where these schemes are abused. So it's the union movement that overseas workers come to when the situation for them is not as it was painted um, when they came over here and took that big step. Um, and there's been some, some quite awful instances where people have come over, either the job they thought they were getting as a project manager isn't a job as a project manager at all, they're actually working as a cleaner. Um, we've had situations where uh, the employer rents premises to these workers and you have 10 people in a house all paying $200 a week of their wages. Um, in rent and there's been real problems around English language requirements. So again, with the review that has occurred, we would, um, we're very firmly of the view that the English language requirements are actually incredibly important. We had a situation on a building site uh, in Sydney a few years ago where we had a number of electricians who couldn't read the safety and danger signs on that site, um, which was, um, a concern to all the workers on that site. So I suppose our view at the moment is the protections that are in place around labour market testing and the English language requirements are important things to have in place and we'd want to see them maintained. Um, and where there is that need to bring in workers from overseas, we would argue that that employer should then be putting some of their profits into skills and training programs as well. Thank you. That's great. We, we have two options. We, we started 10 minutes late. We either cut the discussion down to five minutes, so we split it between the two sessions, or we take 10 minutes now and 10 minutes for the next uh, lot, and we start lunch 10 minutes late. Any votes? <laughs> option, who's for option one? Five, five. Who's for option two, 10? Okay, okay. I'll take the five five. Up. So, uh, uh, questions, please. Yes. Um, when I when I did quite a major study on the impact of immigration on Australian plus structure, which I finished in 1984, the basic picture that came out was that um, there's no such thing as skill in the grand uh, definition. And there's probably no such thing as migrant in the grand definition. The, uh, the dis major distinction was between migrants from English-speaking and non-English-speaking countries. And there was a huge distinction between skills uh, and qualifications uh, at the manual, in manual work and in non-manual work. And the existence of um, problems of recognition of overseas qualifications in particular and to some extent, the problems of literate language, language which that you learn at school meant that the migrants from non-English speaking countries, whatever their background, were channeled into manual work and became in many ways the manual working class. At the same time, the migrants from English speaking countries uh, and the uh, Australian population, almost irrespective of their education, uh, were able to move up into lower white collar work and so on. I don't know if that's still the case today. Nobody has referred to the question of recognition of overseas qualifications as an issue. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't still an issue uh, today. Does somebody want to respond to this? Or? Well, I think it's much less of an issue today. I think the labor force, labor market situation has changed. Um, the, uh, the Asians who come in to Australia uh, as 457s or permanent residents, a lot of them have been uh, educated in Australia, uh, in Australian universities. Uh, they don't have any problem with their skills rec recognition. Skills recognition, you know, at the margin is, is an issue, but it's, uh, it really has dropped off the agenda compared to what it was when, in the period that you're, you're referring to. Uh, um, and partly that's, you know, this try before you buy approach and so on is, is all part of that, you know, that the, the people are, uh, you know, if, if you look at uh, the IT industry, you know, there's a lot of Indians coming in on 457 visas in the IT industry, 
they are highly <coughs> skilled and they're not, they don't have any problems getting their skills recognised. It's, it's, not, a, it's not quite the same issue, I don't think. Uh, the, labor, the labor market has changed. What you're saying is, is I think, true of the United States today, uh, still, that the migrants are at the bottom and push everybody else up. But I don't think it's the case in Australia. Thanks. Um, Liz, um, really important what you said about the integrity of the 457 program. It's a very important program and the greater integrity there is around it, the, the more freely hopefully it can be used when there's a genuine need. Um, departmental stats from the Immigration Department show that when unemployment hits about 5.5%, that's when the usage of the 457 program increases. So with high unemployment, especially in areas like South Australia, the usage of the 457 program is quite low. I think overall at the moment our usage in South Australia of the whole program is around 3%. So it's very different to um, other areas where there's low unemployment uh, such as areas like Western Australia. Um, Riley, what you touched on, sorry Alex, what you touched on um, with the um, working holiday visas and students, I think you could add the dependence of 457 visa holders to that because there's a lot of 457 visa holders um, spouses and children that also work as well and there's there's not a lot of monitoring around um, what happens in, in that respect. Um, Henry, the Migration Council of Australia um, report more than temporary was very good and I think that's very important in the context of what we're talking about today. One of the stats that you didn't um, touch on was that about 70%, this is a finding in the report, about 70% of all 457 visa holders will transition through to permanent residency. So when you're having a look at population growth in South Australia, the use of the 457 program becomes quite important. Our population growth is about 0.9%. If uh, 457 usage is around 3%, then our share of the permanent migration program is going to continue to be quite low. Um, and interesting what you said about university lecturers. It was uh, in South Australia last year, there was only 80 visas, primary visas granted to university lecturers. The, the top was uh, general practitioners. But in South Australia, the biggest user of the 457 program is the state government. So the state government recognises the importance of the program. So I think it's very important that, um, that there is some um, really robust discussions about the importance of the program and what it means to, um, to, to South Australia. Um, at the moment in South Australia... Can we just have it a little bit shorter? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I just clarify that appointment on 70%? 70% of migrants said they had the intention to stay in Australia. That's very different from one in to being a permanent resident. The actual stats from DIAC show that about one in two uh, do end up as a permanent resident, and that trend is rising over time. That 70%, it, it's very easy in a survey to say, oh, yeah, I want to stay in Australia, and then when push comes to shove, maybe other things happen. But yeah, I, take you, I take your overall point, but it's, it's a little bit more nuance than just seven in ten. Sure. So. There's one short question which has been trying to come. I just wanted to go back to the, um, the recognition of um, overseas qualifications, but also linking to what Graham had said earlier today, which was that it appears that uh, migrants um, have a lower um, job attachment or occupation than Australian-borns for the same level of skill. So I'm just wondering, and Graham alluded to that, that might have been a factor of dis discrimination in the workplace, but I wonder whether it is a discrimination against an overseas qualification or a lack of recognition of one as, as well. I think, Peter, would you like to respond? To yeah, this? I don't uh, kind of pick up a lot of discrimination. There, if, if a migrant is coming from overseas through the general entry and not, is not working in Australia when they get their, their permanent residence, uh, it does take a, some time for them to... Uh, we did a study some time ago and it showed that they really only got to the Australian level after about 10 years uh, because they were unknown in Australia. Nobody knows them. Uh, and uh, that uh, it, it really does, and they're, they're not employed for a while. You know. But we do know that uh, you know, from work that uh, Mark uh, Kelly did when he was in the department, that the, the participation rate, in, uh, or the employment rate rather, of uh, migrants in Australia has gone up quite a lot as the mm -hmm. system has changed. Uh, 
so that as the system has changed and moved towards a try before you buy approach, migrants are much more likely to be employed than was the case back in the old days when everybody came in cold and had to start looking around for a job. Uh, and uh, that's, had a big that's had a big impact on, uh, on Australia's GDP, uh, that, that simple change, that, that more, a much higher proportion of migrants are actually working. Any, any more questions? migration agreements, EMAs, uh, they were in the press quite a bit and as a generalist, I'm not a specialist in there, I, I represent a journal in Adelaide called Australian Option uh, Discussions for uh, Social Justice and Political Change. They were introduced by the Federal Labor Government around a SWAN uh, budget in either 2012 or 2013. 2011. Uh, 2011, I stand to be corrected. And like the uh, four, five, sevens, I think they generate anxiety in the community because people don't hear a lot of debate about them. And with the Northeast Asian uh, economies such as China and uh, Japan going to play an increasing role in our resource industries, particularly the gas industry in the Northwest and China uh, being a major player here and some of the local mining magnets uh, not interested in Australian unions too much. Um, What's the state of play with EMAs? Is it, is it a piece of legislation just lying there? And the, the fourth part of what I'd like to know about is I was concerned as a citizen and a former a retired unionist about the Northern Territory situation where you had this big gas plant being built there and with high paying jobs there and apparently the Northern Territory government or, or being able to have a lower set of conditions for a well known Migrant magnet in 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 general, in the general workforce of Darwin, that dual set of conditions in Northern Australia, as a citizen, um, caused me anxiety, and I'm sure it causes a lot of other ordinary Australians a lot of anxiety. So I'd seek a comment from the panel on that, on on some of those issues, particularly the EMAs. I think we have a couple of minutes, and then we have yeah, to, uh, to wrap EMAs, it up. EMAs uh, one EMA has been approved. Uh, in the whole history since uh, 2011. Uh, that was the Roy Hill project, the uh, Gina Reinhardt uh, project. Uh, the, as you know, the, and that was mainly about construction, of course, and, and construction workers rather than kind of miners. Um, and the, uh, the industry turned down, less construction going on, and uh, Gina Reinhardt hasn't taken it up herself. <laughs> but uh, so the, the uh, I, I, when I was in the policy team, we were doing the policy for EMAs and uh, these Northern Territory agreements when they were previously called Regional Migration Agreements. Um, yeah, I, there's no legislation attached to these agreements. It's, it's more uh, a government initiative. They sort of work over the top. Uh, the EMAs are not a visa class, so they will use 457 visas, but they just have different conditions attached to the nominations by employers and the visa holders. Um, as Peter said, I don't know any others that are in the... I know there's some, some wars in the pipeline, but I think as the unemployment has risen over the past... Uh, Roy Hill said they're not going to use theirs. Um, they never formally uh, signed an agreement. It was made in principle. On the Northern Territory Agreement, um, I think there was some misconception of the original press reports last week. Um, there'll be no ability for employers to hire workers at different market rates to Australians. Um, it's just that the level that they can hire them at is going to be adjusted. So if you pay your Australian worker $50,000, you need to pay your 457 visa holder $50,000 as well. But you can't do that in Sydney because the minimum rate is $53,000. So I think it got lost in translation along the way. Um, but I take your, I mean, people are obviously still very concerned about this um, from a point of lowering that threshold. And Darwin's a very expensive place to live. So I'll just make one more comment too on what, what a uh, labour agreements, uh, which are not used very much. Uh, we, uh, in doing the 457 review, thought that labour agreements were quite a good approach to deal with uh, a low end. And uh, there's, uh, there has been a labour agreement in the meat industry, which is really successful. Uh, and, uh, but the important thing about labour agreements is that unions are in there playing a, a very prominent role in negotiating out all the arrangements for the, for the labour agreement. I'd like to ask you to put your hands together to thank our speakers.